Good Sabbath, friends. Thank you for joining us today. Let's start with a little lift today. I'm going to play Love Lifted Me by James Rowe. And after I play, Alan will come with the announcements and the opening prayer. Very nice, Jackie. Well, good to have with everyone. Uh, this past Monday, April the 8th, as you know, there was a total eclipse of the sun over parts of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Now, Jackie and I traveled to Indiana to see this awesome sight. We saw the moon appear as a hole in the sky. We saw the bright corona extending out far beyond the sun itself. Unlike the eclipse in 2017, we saw solar prominences extending outward from the sun. It's red, bright red dots, you might say. And we then start, <coughs> suddenly heard crickets and birds making sounds as it got dark, and it turned cooler with a pleasant breeze. It was truly an awesome experience. However, there were things that people predicted for that day that we did not experience. Uh, the comet Pons Brooks, otherwise known by some as the Devil Comet, was predicted to shine ominously in the sky during the eclipse as some type of warning. But the comet was not visible, at least not with the naked eye anyway. And what about the predicted alignment of the planets that was said to likely cause worldwide upheaval of the Earth in the form of earthquakes, erupting volcanoes, etc.? In fact, it was even suggested that the New Madrid Fault would see a devastating earthquake on that day. Well, as I looked at the eclipse sun, I didn't notice any planets near the sun. Well, that surprised me a bit since I knew that Jupiter and Saturn would be very bright and easily visible during the eclipse. Well, it turned out that I had underestimated just how far apart the planets, those two planets would be in the sky at the time of the eclipse. I mean, Jupiter appeared at an angle something like this from the sun. It was pretty far away. Venus, on the other hand, was on the other side of the sun at an angle something like this. So they were very far apart. So planets lining up in a straight line with the sun, well, not even close, as I'm sure all of us that witnessed this eclipse would testify. And no, we didn't have any catastrophic earthquake that New Madrid fault during the eclipse. There were many other things that were predicted for the day of the eclipse that did not happen. So why didn't they happen? As I said long before the day of the actual eclipse, unfortunately, many false prophets make things up to get our attention and make merchandise of us. And when they do that, we should just ignore them and stick with the Bible. Well, it's definitely time to be preparing for the beginning of this year's Holy Day cycle. 
We'll be talking about the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread during this week's service and again next Sabbath. I believe the only way to truly come to understand God's actual plan of salvation is by observing God's annual holy days. The only way to do that is to keep all of God's appointed times year after year, just as he asked us to do. Now, many will be observing Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread in just over one week from now. If you have questions or would like any assistance with observing the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, please give us a call and we'd be glad to try to help. We already have a pre-recorded Passover service for those who might like a guided Passover service this year. You can find a link to this service right under the welcome near the top of our homepage. And I think that's about it for today. Let's go ahead. Uh, that's the end of the announcements. I think let's go ahead and get started with prayer. Our great Heavenly Father, thank you once again for our many blessings. We can never thank you enough. Thank you for your holy days, both for your weekly Sabbath days and your annual high Sabbath days that teach us about your great plan of salvation. We thank you for the blessings of peace and comfort that your Sabbath days bring to us. Please be with us and help us as we prepare for your appointed times this year. Help us to deepen our understanding of your holy days that reveal your great plan to us. And please inspire the message today and help us all draw closer to you and your great son. We ask in the name, of course, of that great son, the son that made our salvation possible, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first hymn is on page 226, By This Shall All Men Know, by Russ Judson. This hymn's text is based on John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. That's hymn number 226, By This Shall All Men Know.
Our next hymn is on page 242, If I Have Not Charity by Dwight Armstrong. This hymn text is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, better known as the love chapter. That's page 242, If I Have Not Charity. And now for today's message, Alan Holt with The First Passover. Again, welcome everyone. God's annual holy day season will begin in less than two weeks from now with Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They'll be followed later this year by, of course, Pentecost, Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and, of course, ending with the Last Great Day. Now, I always get excited every year at this time when we begin to rehearse God's great plan of salvation by observing His annual holy days. I hope I don't get too excited today. I speak fast enough as it is, right? But anyway, it is quite a blessing to see and to rehearse God's great plan of salvation. So God's annual holy days are rehearsals. We rehearse them each year, and year after year, we gain more insight into God's true plan to save mankind, and each year we grow closer to God. Since we have two weekly Sabbaths, including today before Passover, I thought I'd like to talk about the first Passover with the four-legged lambs today. Next Sabbath, we'll talk about how Jesus Christ became our Passover lamb. Let's get started. Let's go ahead and turn right away to Genesis chapter 37, if you would. Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. We're going to back up quite a bit to this story. I think most of us are familiar with the story of Jacob, aren't we? Later called Israel and his 12 sons. Now, Jacob's son Joseph was hated by his 11 brothers. Did you know that? Now, why did his brothers hate him so much? Again, Genesis 37, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now this was a special coat and it demonstrated Israel's favoritism for Joseph, I'd say. Verse 4. 
And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So Joseph's brothers came to hate him so much that they could not even talk to him politely. At least not as some translations say. But things got even worse. Verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. What was this dream that Joseph told to his brothers? The dream that caused them to hate Joseph even more. Let's see in verse 6. He said to them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. So now he's going to tell them about the dream. Verse 7. For behold, we, now that's Joseph and his eleven brothers, behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose, and it also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. The eleven sheaves representing Joseph's eleven brothers bowed down to Joseph's sheaf. Verse 8. And his brethren said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Well, Actually, Joseph dreamed yet another dream in verse 9 that made things even worse if that was possible by that time. But Joseph's brothers came to hate him so much that they eventually conspired to kill him. Drop down to verse 20. Verse 20, if you would. So here's what his brothers said. Genesis 37, verse 20. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say, some evil beast has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. So uh, his brothers planned to put an end to Joseph and his dreams once and for all. It was actually Reuben that stopped them from actually killing Joseph. Thanks to Reuben. Verse 21. And Reuben, who was the oldest of the twelve brothers, by the way, and Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand on him, that he might that that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben was hoping to get the other brothers just to throw Joseph into a pit and not actually kill him. Some translations of the Bible say the pit was actually a dry well, which looks to be the case. Now later, Reuben planned to rescue Joseph from that pit, since he wasn't dead then, or well and take him back to his father. Verse 24. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Again, this was likely an empty well they threw him into. Now, it just happened that a company of Ishmaelites came by, and these were merchants. Joseph's brothers then sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Turn over to Genesis 30, uh, 39, if you would. That's Genesis chapter 39. And we'll begin right there in verse 1, Genesis 39. Now, meanwhile, the brothers took Joseph's coat of many colors we talked about and dipped it in the blood of a goat. Then they showed the bloody coat to their father and suggested that Joseph been, had been eaten by wild beasts. Can you imagine that, how traumatic that was for Jacob or Israel? Anyway, he was very upset, no doubt. Let's get back to Joseph. We're looking at Joseph right now. Again, Genesis 39, verse 1. What happened to Joseph? Well, Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. Or as the contemporary English version says, the Ishmaelites took Joseph to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar, the king's official, in charge of the palace guard. So Joseph was now in Egypt, and he was serving in Potiphar's house. Verse 2, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master, that's Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Potiphar could see that God was with Joseph and was blessing all that Joseph did. I think that's obvious with some of us today. It's obvious that we can see that we're being blessed. People can see that. So verse 4. 
And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put it into his hand. So here we see that things are actually going very well for Joseph, at least until Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of making advances to her. And unfortunately for that false accusation, Joseph ended up in prison. And again, we're going through this pretty quick, but uh, then Joseph's ability to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams got him out of prison. Now, actually, it was God who interpreted the dreams through Joseph, but they thought Joseph was responsible, probably. And after that, he went right back to what he was doing. And eventually, Joseph ended up with a very high position in Egypt, even much greater than what he was before when he was put into prison. He became second in command only to the Pharaoh. Wow, that's, that's pretty good. But then the famine came that fulfilled the Pharaoh's dream that Joseph had interpreted. Now Jacob sent all his sons, except Benjamin, his youngest, he sent, uh, he sent all his sons to Egypt to purchase grain during the famine. They had grain. They saved up for it, remember? Let's turn to Genesis 46, verse 5. If you would, that's Genesis 46, verse 5. Now, Joseph recognized his brothers when they arrived in Egypt, but they didn't recognize him. And Joseph then accused them of being spies and kept Simeon until they returned with Benjamin. He wanted them all there. So the brothers took the grain back to Jacob, but then the grain eventually ran out. So what happened then? Let's look at uh, Genesis 46, verse 5. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives and the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry them. They took their cattle and their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with them, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. So due to the famine, Jacob, Joseph's other brothers, and their families came to live in Egypt, Goshen to be specific. Let's turn next over to Exodus, very beginning, Exodus uh, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of Exodus. Now, I know I've skipped a lot here, but time has passed, and Joseph and all his brothers eventually died. That, that happens, of course. And when they did, well, things stopped going quite so well for the Israelites. Again, Exodus 1 and verse 1. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And of course, Joseph was already in Egypt, making up the twelve sons of Jacob. Verse 5. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren in all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Joseph was quickly forgotten, apparently. Verse 9. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falls out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. So here we see the Israelites were made slaves to the Egyptian rulers. Let's see what else happens. Verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor, or some translations say cruelty. At any rate, the Israelites became enslaved to the Egyptians. Verse 15. And the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Puah. And he said, 
When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon their stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So the boys that were born of the Hebrews were to be killed. But did the midwives do as they were commanded? Did they kill all the firstborn males? Let's see, verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men's children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men's children alive? Well, they were obviously defying this order. So I'd say the midwives were probably in trouble, you'd think. But what excuse did they give to the king of Egypt while they weren't doing what he'd said? Verse 19. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere or before the midwives come into them. So they're saying, well, hey, you know, the Hebrew women were giving birth to their babies so quick that the midwives couldn't arrive. Apparently, I guess, labor wasn't very long. They just had babies quickly. Verse 20. Therefore, God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. So the Pharaoh still had a problem. Verse 21, and it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. So God's rewarding them. But not necessarily the Pharaoh. Verse 22, and the Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every son that is born you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. So again, Pharaoh ordered all the male babies of the Hebrews to basically to be killed. They'd be tossed in the river. Does that sound familiar maybe? I mean, something like, like that happened when Christ was born. And of course, Herod ordered all male children, two years old and under, to be killed. So that uh, may be a little foretelling there. But let's go to the next verse. Uh, that's Exodus 2, verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife to the daughter, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off, to wit, what will be done to him? I mean, after all, she threw him in the river, it was just, in, just in a basket, right, that would float. Okay, verse 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maids walked along by the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to you a nurse of the Hebrew women, that, you may, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. We know who this is, don't we? Well, it'll tell us in verse 10. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Now, I think we know that Moses was raised then as an Egyptian. And again, we're skipping a lot, but uh, after Moses became an adult, he witnessed an Egyptian beating one of his brother Israelites. Well, Moses took issue with that, and Moses killed the Egyptian. That was not a good thing, uh, at least as far as the Pharaoh was concerned. But before the Pharaoh could kill Moses, Moses fled Egypt. He got out of there. And later we know that Moses helped seven daughters of Jethro, the priest of Midian, to water their sheep. And Moses decided to stay with her family and ended up marrying Zipporah, one of Jethro's daughters. Let's pick up that story in Exodus chapter 3. That's Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Just one chapter over from where we are now. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Did any of us watch the movie The Ten Commandments? Cease to be the mill? Yeah. Well, personally, I think it does a very nice job of telling the story of Moses and that first Passover. But, of course, there were a few deviations from what our Bibles actually say, and, of course, there were a few Hollywood embellishments. But overall, considering everything, I thought it was very well done. 
Now, Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So Moses noticed this bush that appeared to be burning, but didn't burn itself out. It just kept on burning. Now, if I was there, I think I would have probably wondered how this bush caught on fire in the first place. And that would be odd to me, but the fact that it didn't seem to actually burn up, well, that would get someone's attention, I'm sure, like it did Moses. Verse 3, Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while, this, while the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Draw not near here. Put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place whereon you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Prop to verse 10. Come now therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God sent Moses to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Let's drop on down to verse 18, if you would now. We'll skip a little bit through here. Verse 18. And they shall hearken to your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now let us go, we beseech you, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. Verse 20. And I will stretch out my hand, and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that, he will let you go. Well, God told Moses he would perform many wonders, you might say. But in fact, we know these wonders became plagues on the Egyptians. In fact, Egyptian, I'm sorry, Egypt suffered ten plagues. Now, at first, the Israelites suffered these plagues right alongside the Egyptians. They all were suffering these plagues. They suffered as the Nile turned to blood. And then came the plagues of frogs and then of lice. But then... There came a clear division between Egypt and God's people, the Israelites. In verse 21, I won't read it, but it's right there. In verse 21, we see a plague of flies. But at this point, the Israelites were no longer affected by the plagues that the Egyptians had to deal with. Notice verse 22. And I will say, for in that day, the land of Goshen, that's just where they lived, in which my people dwell, okay, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end, you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. So more plagues came. But now, God kept these plagues from his people. He didn't rapture them away or take them out of there. He protected them right there where they were. And they were a witness to what happened to the Egyptians. The plagues that were upon the Egyptians. They were a witness, but they didn't experience them. God protected his people during these last plagues. Well, like the plagues that Egypt suffered due to, due to their idolatry and their refusal to obey God, one day in our future, our world will suffer plagues once again in a time known as the Great Tribulation. And I believe just like with the Egyptian plagues, God's people will live in the midst of these plagues as well. But turn to Psalm 91 with me, if you would. Psalm 91 and verse 1. Psalm 91 will begin in verse 1. But having said that, I also believe that at some point, God will once again make a distinction between those who are and who are not his people. So again, at the beginning of the plagues that were upon Egypt, the Israelites suffered right along with them. But it didn't last long. 
Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. The word pestilence here is the Hebrew word 1696 in Strong's. It's Daber in the Hebrew, and it means pestilence or plague, by the way. Verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. So from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, look up the word buck, buckler. Buckler means, could mean a small round shield held by a handle at arm's length, and that's to extend the main shield for added protection. It can also mean, this is a definition given also by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it can also mean one that shields and protects. God promises his people that his truth shall be their shield and their buckler, meaning a shield all around us to protect us in the coming tribulation. What about those that reject God and his commandments, though, that aren't God's people? Well, like the Egyptians we're reading about here, presumably they won't have that surrounding shield of protection. So I'd say that it's certainly a good time to come out of Babylon right now and the false teachings that many of us have experienced. You know, when these final plagues hit, when things do really get rough, if we get a chance to see that, just remember, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny won't be there to protect us. No, we want to be surrounded by God's shield of protection, as the Israelites were when the plagues were upon Egypt. We don't want to be in the same place the Egyptians were when their plagues came. If we reject all the false teachings and all the idolatry we see going on today, if we do that, get rid of all that, we should know better. And if we sincerely worship God in spirit and in truth to the best of our ability, then, verse 5, you shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. And that's what the Israelites did when they were, before they left Egypt. They saw the reward of the Egyptians. But like the Israelites that were protected from those plagues that ultimately resulted in many deaths of the Egyptians, I believe God's people will be protected when the Great Tribulation comes. God will again make a difference between those who truly belong to him and those who don't, just as he did in Egypt. And I would say that right now, the way things are going on in the world, well, now might be a particularly good time to draw closer to God and to separate ourselves from the idolatry of today's world. So let's pay close attention to these next few verses, if you would. Verse 9. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, there shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. There will come a time when the earth will be struck with plagues and destruction, but I believe God's people will find refuge in him. But let's go back to the ancient Egyptian. Uh, uh, yeah, let's go back to the, well, let's go back. <laughs> let's see how God protected or saved those Israelites in Egypt who had death staring them right there in the face. Turn to Exodus 11, if you would, 11 verse 4. Exodus 11 verse 4. Now, the last plague at Egypt was the death of the firstborn. But God prepared a way to save his people from this plague of death. Let's see how he did it. Again, let's rejoin our story in Exodus 11, verse 4. And Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. And the firstborn of the Pharaoh that sits upon his throne, 
even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry, that's a great cry, throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. Well, that sounds pretty serious. But you know, comparing this to the coming great tribulation, remember what Jesus said about that tribulation in Matthew 24, 21. Let me just read that to you. Christ says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. But notice how God protects his people from these plagues uh, back in Egypt. Verse 7, uh, Exodus 11, verse 7. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord does put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. A difference between the Egyptians who followed false gods and those who followed the true God, God's, God's true people. For the last plague, death was to come to the, all the firstborn of Egypt, but the children of Israel were excluded. Death was going to pass over them that night. Turn over to Exodus 12, verse 1 next, if you would. That's Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Now here we'll see how God saved his people then. How the sacrifice of innocent lambs allowed the Israelites to live that night when the angel of death arrived in Egypt. Again, Exodus 12, verse 3. Speak you unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So the Israelites were to select a lamb on the tenth day of the month, first month of the year. Verse 4. If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Okay. But now this couldn't be just any lamb. This had to be a perfect lamb, one without blemish. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Well, this also had to be a young male lamb. Verse 6. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall keep it in the evening. So the lamb that was selected on the tenth day of the first month had to be kept alive until the fourteenth day of the month. Then the lamb was to be killed. The historian Josephus recorded that the Passover lambs were killed from about the ninth hour until the eleventh hour. That would be what we consider from approximately 3 p.m. until 5 p.m., assuming a 6 p.m. sunset. So they were killed late afternoon, according to the historian Josephus. But at any rate, the lambs were sacrificed on the 14th day of the first month, likely in the afternoon, but before sunset. Verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Well, that's important. Now, if the lambs were killed on the afternoon of the 14th, then if they were eaten that night, that night would actually begin the next day on God's calendar. What day would that be? Killed on the 14th, night comes, new day, 15th day of the first month, right? So that means the sacrificed lambs were eaten after dark at the beginning of the 15th day of the first month. Once again, verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, during the beginning, the dark portion of the 15th, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. So the lamb was to be roasted whole, which would likely take, I'm thinking, several hours to cook over a fire. Verse 10. You shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. They were to get rid of it. Verse 11. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste, 
It's the Lord's Passover. So why were they eating in haste? Why were they told to do this? Well, again, the uh, lambs were sacrificed late in the afternoon. They had to be had their blood drained. They had to be cooked for a while. I think that went on into the night, most likely. But what was going to happen around midnight? They need to be ready, right? They couldn't just lay around. Okay, we know that the death angel would arrive around midnight that night, the night of the 15th. So the Israelites didn't have time to eat their lamb right at sunset and just lie around waiting for midnight to arrive. I think they didn't have a lot of time here. So I'm suspecting they ate those lambs closer to midnight. As it drew near, they needed to be ready to leave Egypt and in a hurry. We'll see that in a few minutes. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Now, all the firstborn, even the firstborn of the animals, all the firstborn. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. Where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So that night, the firstborn of the Israelites would be saved from death. Saved from death by the blood of a sacrificed lamb. Those with the blood of the lamb on their dwelling would have death pass over them that night. Death would pass over them. They would be saved by the blood of a lamb. And as to be expected with God, everything went to plan. Everything happened just as he said it would. And of course, God through Moses then delivered his people out of Egypt on the 15th day of the first month. At least he began to anyway. Now, we'll be looking at the exodus of God's people from Egypt during the upcoming Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there'll be more about that. But that wasn't the end of being passed over. This Passover was not to be forgotten. God commanded us to remember this event as a memorial forever on the 15th day of his first month. Verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And so we are to observe this day each year in remembrance of those Israelites that were freed from the bondage in Egypt, and to remember those that were saved by the blood of a lamb. And also to remember that God rescued those in bondage in Egypt and set them free. He set them on their journey to the promised land, just as he will one day deliver us from sin to live with him in his promised kingdom. But there's even more to this observance. Verse 15. There are other things he's asked us to do. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now that's a very serious thing. Being cut off from Israel means you no longer have a covenant with the Almighty. So he's no longer obligation to do anything like save you. So that's a serious thing to be cut off. We don't want to do that. Verse 16. Then the first day there shall be a holy convocation. In the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. Now, this defines the first and second annual holy days of the year. Right here. So let's go ahead and verse uh, 17 next. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Verse 18. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at even. Now that's at sunset on the 14th, marking the beginning of the 15th. You shall eat unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at even. So it, the sun goes down on the 20, uh, 1 and 20th day, the 21st day, that's the end of eating the unleavened bread. Uh, and it's not that we just need to eat unleavened bread every day during the seven-day period. We're certainly commanded to do that. 
but we're also to remove all leaven from our dwellings. In fact, I really suspect that cleaning the leaven out of our homes each spring probably, let's say, I'll, I'll call it morphed, <laughs> it morphed into what many call spring cleaning today. And they clean their house out. Well, I think it may have started with that. Although no one really seems to know where their tradition of spring cleaning actually came from. Although I kind of suspect I might. But verse 19. Let's continue here. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. Okay, that's pretty plain. Now, houses here is a Hebrew word, bayeth. It doesn't necessarily mean just the physical structure of a house. It could also mean court, within or without, by definition. That would mean that we should have no leaven on our property. And that would include our vehicles as well. It's not just our houses. It's a property we own. Again, Exodus 12, verse 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whoever eats that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. As I said, being, cutting off, <clears throat> being cut off from Israel is a very serious thing. Our very salvation could be affected by that. Verse 20. You shall not eat, you shall eat nothing leavened, and all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. Probably down to verse 24, if you would. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to you and your sons, hello, forever. Okay. Yeah, I think the Eternal doesn't specifically ask us to do very much as far as rituals are concerned. He does ask us to rid our dwellings of leaven for this one week and to eat unleavened bread each day during this period. And we'll talk more about why that might be next, next Sabbath. But we know that unleavened bread is called the bread of affliction in Deuteronomy 16.3. When the Israelites left Egypt in haste, they had no time to let the dough rise, so they ate unleavened bread. At any rate, uh, we're to remove the leaven from our dwellings and eat unleavened bread for seven straight days to remind us of how the Israelites left Egypt. Verse 25. It shall come to pass, when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he has promised, that you shall keep this service. It shall come to pass, when your children shall say to you, What mean you by this service? That you shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And of course, our children will never ask us about the Lord's Passover if we never observe it, right? So, difficult to do. So, on the night of the 15th, death struck the firstborn of the Egyptians, but not one of the firstborn of the Israelites died. Rather, they were passed over by the death angel, saved by the blood of the Lamb. And then, they left the bondage of Egypt and headed out for the promised land. Drop way down to verse 46 as we wind this up. Verse 46. Now here I'd like to point out that no bones of the Passover lamb to be broken. Now you may wonder why that's so important, but this foreshadowed the coming of Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. In fact, prophecy in Psalm 3420 tells us regarding Jesus Christ, he keeps all his bones not one of them is broken. And we'll see that's the case next week. Uh, verse 46. In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall you break a bone thereof. Again, fulfilling prophecy. And the congregation of Israel shall keep it, meaning the Passover. And again, the Israelites were not to break any of the bones of those four-legged lambs. So again, we'll see next week. When Jesus uh, became our Passover lamb, that none of his bones will be broken. But that's next week. Let's get back to the leaven. Now, we're told to remove all the leaven from our dwellings during the seven-day period of unleavened bread. Leaven is analogous to being puffed up as in being puffed up with pride. And the leaven represents sin during this seven-day period. Now, I know we all try really hard to eliminate the leaven from our homes, just like we try to eliminate the sin in our lives. But those of us that have done this a while, or maybe some that haven't, maybe some that are newer at it, what often happens 
after we think we removed all the leaven from our homes? We've checked everything, right? We under the couch, uh, everywhere. What almost, not always, but often happens, well, often we find some later that was hidden. Something that we missed. We thought we had it all, but, but we missed something. And much like the sin we think we may have eliminated from our lives, like the leaven, we might just find some sin left in us after we think we've eliminated it. So both the leaven and this exercise and our sins are very difficult to completely eliminate. And more on that shortly. So what is leaven? What are we supposed to remove from our homes? Well, that's a good question. Well, my understanding is that leaven is practically anything that is added to flour or dough that can cause it to puff up. Leaven can be biological like yeast, physical like uh, beaten egg whites, or chemicals such as baking soda because all these agents can puff up bread. So before the first day of unleavened bread, which would be the 15th day of the month, we need to inspect our pantries, our freezers, refrigerators, and other food storage places and remove any product that has leavening agents in it. We need to check the labels of these types of products carefully. Some things people often miss, I understand, are things like self-rousing flour, chow mein noodles, wheat thins, hmm, and some other flat crackers that have baking soda in them. There are some things that have baking soda in them. Excuse me. There are some things that have baking soda. Okay, excuse me one second. Try it again. There are some things that have baking soda in them that I personally believe we can actually keep. I'm talking about things like toothpaste, deodorant, pet food, perhaps baking soda used to deodorize our refrigerators or to treat water for hot tubs or pools. Now, these are not intended to be food for us, and they won't continue to puffing anything up like bread. And that's my understanding anyway. But as always, we should be convicted to do whatever we believe God directs us to do. Now, we still have just over a week to get the leaven removed from our homes. And don't forget about our vehicles, too. They might also contain leaven, especially if we eat in our vehicles. I know many of us do in our busy lives. You might be saying, you know, but we know we can never get sin completely out of our lives. And Paul told us that all sin and come short of the glory of God. This should never keep us from doing the very best we can to eliminate as much sin as possible. Otherwise, how do we grow to be more like Christ? So what about the leaven in our homes that represents sin during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Oh, like our sin today, actually, we cannot totally get rid of the leaven in our homes either. A couple of years ago, a good brother and sister from Canada informed me that wild yeast is always floating in the air. This wild yeast is already present in the air of our homes. It can actually be used for making bread rice. So even if we're successful in removing all the leaven we can find, there will always be some left floating in the air, invisible to us perhaps, just as sin can be. But in both cases, removing sin from our lives as well as removing the leaven from our property during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we need to do the very best we can to eliminate them. I do believe there are very important lessons to be learned by removing the leaven from our homes during this seven-day period. But as always, we know God knows exactly what he's doing. So before we end today, let's take a very brief look at that four-legged Passover lamb again. I'd like to look at some of the specific characteristics of the lamb. If you're taking notes, you might want to write these down. We'll be referring to them next Sabbath. Okay, so here they are. Uh, the Israelites' firstborn, of course, were saved from death by the blood of a lamb on the doorpost. That lamb was to be selected on the 10th day of the first month. That lamb was to be a young male without blemish. The lamb was to be killed on the 14th day of the first month. And the lamb's bones were to be broken. And the body of the lamb was to be eaten after dark during the night of the 15th. The angel of death passed over those who had placed the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. They were passed over. Which is great, but this was actually only a temporary reprieve from death. Eventually, even all those Israelites that were saved that night died anyway. You know, none of the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament could actually take away our sin. They were used to, they were used to remind us of our sin and the need for atonement 
if we're to have eternal life. The Old Testament Passover also looked forward to the time in the future when the blood of another lamb could save us from death. But this time, it wouldn't be a temporary reprieve. The blood of this lamb could save us for good. The blood of this lamb can allow us and our loved ones to live for eternity. Much greater lamb. That first Passover and the exit from Egypt that the ancient Israelites experienced also foreshadowed a much greater Passover that was yet to come. We'll see that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Passover perfectly in every detail, as foreshadowed by those very first Passover lambs. And he also fulfilled additional Bible prophecy as well. So next Sabbath, one week from today, we'll look at Jesus Christ as he became our Passover lamb as we continue to prepare for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's certainly time for all of us to prepare for the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread if we haven't already started. We need to remove the leaven from our homes and vehicles and our property in general to make sure that we'll have unleavened bread to eat for all seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We need to make ready for the Passover. We'll talk more about this next Sabbath. And if we here at the Independent Church of God Seventh Day might be of any assistance, please let us know. We'd love to try to help. I pray that we all prepare to have a very meaningful and a very inspirational experience as we begin this year's Holy Day cycle. Hope to see you all again next week as we take a look at our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. For our closing hymn, we will sing page 246, Ambassadors for Christ by Ross Jetsam. After we sing, Alan will come off our closing prayer. That's page 246, Ambassadors for Christ. Jesus Christ, the Savior of all.
similar prayer. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our calling. As we enter this year's Holy Day season, please have your Holy Spirit continue to teach us all things. Help us to grow to become more like you and your Son. Help us to truly appreciate what your Son did for us as he gave his life for us that we may live. Help us to understand the magnitude of his great and selfless sacrifice, the one he made for you and me and for all of us that have ever lived or will live in the future. That we might live for eternity in God's great kingdom. As we go closer to the end of the age, please extend your protection to us. Please keep your buckler, your shield all around us as we enter into these trying times. We ask all in the name of your great Son and our Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ. Amen.